Hello! Welcome to the Introduction to Proofs video for Inverse Functions. My name is Professor Michael Polyuk. The learning objectives for this video are, by the end of this video, you should be able to produce the inverse of a simple function. This video is mostly appropriate for students in high school, although we might use a little bit of notation that's specific to the Intro to Proofs course. Our motivation is that we know that x squared and square root of x are, quote, inverse functions because they undo each other. If you apply one and then the other, you get back to x. Well, most of the time. There's a slight issue about absolute values, but for the most part, they undo each other. So our goal is to figure out what does this mean precisely? How do we find inverse functions? And when do inverse functions even exist? Let's start with a definition. Let f from a to b be a bijection. The inverse of the function f is a function g from something to something, I'll get to it, that assigns to any number or any value b in b the unique a in a such that f of a is equal to b. So let's unpack this a little bit. The inverse is the function that should undo f. So if f goes from a to b and we want to go backwards, where should g go? It should go from b to a. And now let's unwrap the second part. The inverse function, if it takes in b, it should output the a that gave it to you. Why is this unique? Well, this is unique because it's a bijection. In particular, it's an injection. And how do we know that there is actually at least one? Well, that's because it's a surjection. So you can review the section on injections and surjections if you need to understand that a bit better. So any function that does this, we'll call this the function f inverse. The superscript minus one is a little bit confusing. Um, it's not a reciprocal, it's not one over something, but it's the notation we use. A couple things to notice before we get into some examples. The key defining feature of an inverse function is that f of a is equal to b if and only if the inverse function when applied to the output gives you that input. So you can kind of, thinking of think of this as apply f to both sides if you want. The second thing is that there's often an issue about what's the domain of these things. So let's take a moment to think about what happens when you apply f inverse then f. So what are you allowed to plug into here? What, what sort of things is f allowed to take in? Well, it's allowed to take in anything from capital A. And it turns out that if you do f inverse then f, it undoes itself, so it gives you back A. Now, what happens if you apply f inverse first and then f? Well, what sort of things is f inverse allowed to take in? f inverse goes from B to A, so this will be anything from B. These are the two most important parts about an inverse, that they undo the functions and that you can define one from the other. Now let's look at some examples. x squared and square root of x are inverses of each other. So let f be the function from close 0 to infinity to close 0 to infinity, where it's x squared, and then f inverse will have the same domain and codomain, but this time it will be uh, square root of x. This should be to the power minus 1. Should be a little minus 1 right there. There we go. So these are inverse functions because they undo each other. So the question is, why did we restrict the domain of x squared to just close 0 to positive infinity? Couldn't we have just taken the whole domain of the reals? Well, we did this so that our function would pass the horizontal line test. And we did that because we wanted its inverse to pass the vertical line test and be a function. So in order to do that, we had to restrict the domain of x squared here. Let's look at another example e to the x and log x are inverses of each other. So let f be the function from the reals to 
open 0 to infinity, which is e to the x. And then the inverse function log will go from 0 infinity to the reals. And you can see in a picture very clearly that they're inverses of each other. Here's e to the x. We reflect it along the line y equals x and get log x. Our next question is, when does a function have an inverse? So there are two very important properties. A function itself needs to pass the horizontal line test in order for its inverse to pass the vertical line test. And passing the horizontal line test means is an injection. The second important thing is that your original function needs to reach all the values in B in order for its inverse to be defined on all of B. So this means it needs to be a surjection. So together we get the following theorem. If f is a function from a to b, then being a bijection is equivalent to the inverse exists and is defined on all of b. And in fact, these properties line up. The inverse existing is the same, is equivalent to one to one, and being onto is equivalent to being defined on all of b. The takeaway from this theorem is that inverses exist for bijections. Let's look at a couple more examples. The first example will be using arrow notation. So consider the function from 1, 2, 3 to a, b, c, defined by f of 1 is a, f of 2 is c, and f of 3 is b, denoted right here. What's the domain and codomain of the inverse function? Well, the inverse function goes the other direction. So its, code, its, its domain should be the codomain of the original function, it should go from a, b, c to 1, 2, 3. And now we can ask questions like, what happens when you plug in a to the inverse function? What about b? What about c? Well, the way you get the answer to this is by figuring out what does f map to a? Well, f maps 1 to a, so that means that the inverse value is 1. The thing that maps to b is 3, so f inverse of b is 3, and similarly f inverse of c is 2, because 2 maps to c. So let's draw the inverse function. So the inverse function here has this as its domain, and this as its codomain. This example is helpful because it really shows off visually how to find um, the codomain and domain of the inverse and how each of the points of the inverse are defined. The next example we're going to look at is more algebraic and it hides a little bit of what's going on, but it's the kind of example you'll see uh, in real life. We'll do that in the next video.